Testing, testing. If you have a bulletin handy, open it up. We'll go over some of the things that are coming up. Next Sunday, Brother Andy Tully will be with us. Three things that you need to do. Uh, you need to be praying about that meeting. Uh, Brother Tully always says that uh, no man brings revival in a suitcase. So we just need to pray that God would use him in a special way uh, to be a blessing, encouragement to our church and uh, to those that come may not know Christ. So be praying about it. Uh, plan on being here for all the meetings. I know it's hard. I'll be the first to admit special meetings are hard uh, because we're coming uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. So it's difficult, but it's worth coming. All right. So plan on being here and then uh, invite somebody. Uh, again, uh, I promise you that the, uh, that the gospel message will be delivered. So Especially if you know somebody needs to know Christ, try to get them here. Uh, work day this month will be on the 24th, starting at 9 o'clock. Business meeting on the 25th, that's to go over the quarterly reports, also family day. Uh, you know the schedule for that. On May the 2nd, that's our DVD Sunday, and also communion. And also, we're going to nominate officers on that day. Uh, on the 20th, we have VCA graduation awards, work day next month 22nd and then on the 23rd that's family day and also we will elect church officers on that day all right i feel like i'm out of breath what is going on here uh, the meeting monday tuesday wednesday is that a church or seven o'clock seven o'clock monday night tuesday night wednesday night all right um, also we are having vacation bible school meeting following the service this morning if we don't forget Okay, I have to keep adding that all the time now for some reason, I don't know. All right, uh, something that um, I want to share with you is an opportunity. I had a fellow stop by the office last week. Um, he's with Earth Surface Solutions, which is an a excavating company, but the excavating company exists to fund ministry, that is to uh, a drug rehab program, and they are hosting a fundraiser that's going to be at the uh, Cross America. How many of you know where that's at? All right, most of you, I think, uh, do. That's a beautiful facility. Um, they are going to have Taylor Mason. And if you've been to our uh, watch night services, we, we've watched some videos of him. He's a Christian comedian. He's absolutely hilarious. Uh, it's clean comedy, uh, which is rare anymore. But he had, he's also a ventriloquist, very, very entertaining. Uh, they are hosting him to a dinner theater, which will be on May the 1st from 6 to 9. That is if you come uh, for the meal. And uh, the way they're doing this, that we can sponsor a table. If we get eight people that are interested, uh, we, we have four already, so we need four, at least four more. You don't have to be coupled, but we need at least four more people the cost is $49, and that's dinner 
and, um, and then the uh, Taylor Mason's uh, program. Yeah, per person, $49 per person, because it's uh, $392 per table. And again, we have four people that have mentioned they'd like to go. If you're interested, make sure that you get with me today, because if we don't have those eight people, I'm not going to uh, reserve a table. Also, if you don't want the meal, you can just go for the show, and it's $25. So I don't know that we'd have to be, I guess we have to turn in um, reservations because they do have limited seating there. So if you're interested in that, please, first of all, make yourself a note right now because I know what happens, right? Uh, you hear that, you hear the good singing, the good preaching, and you're just all caught up in the Lord and you walk out the door, you forget everything. So uh, make yourself a note that you'll see me afterwards. And also, again, if you're going to be involved in Vacation Bible School, I forgot to bring the shirts, but we have shirts and everything already because we uh, were geared up last year. But if you will stay for a few minutes afterwards, we'll appreciate that if you want to help with Vacation Bible School, which is going to be uh, July something. Do you remember the dates on that? Pardon? All right, 11 through the 15th. Now it sounds right. 11 through the 15th. Okay, um, let's sing hymn number 66. Stand if you're able as Bruce comes to lead us. 66 in your hymnal. 66. <laughs>
that old yucky day, but you know what? When you have Jesus in your heart, you have sunshine every day, don't you? Amen. Because you have the presence of the Son himself. So we're glad that you're here this morning, and may the Lord bless you for having come out. I had a good offering last week, as you can see from the offering report, and we are thanking the Lord for that. So uh, just continue to pray, and we thank God for the stewards that uh, are part of our ministry here at uh, Victory. The missionary of the week is the Blackwells in South Africa, so remember to pray for them as well as to pray for all of our missionary. I know I say that all the time, but I, I really want you to do that uh, because all of our missionaries need prayer and uh, they need uh, God God. You know, they take off and go someplace where nobody invited them. And uh, so many times they're in a culture that doesn't like them. Uh, and they may not necessarily have a love for that culture, but uh, we need to pray for the missionaries. Our, our stewardship verse this morning is from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, where it says there, no one can serve two masters, or no person can serve two masters, no man. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Maybe you've heard, and probably you know this from your grade school or high school studies, maybe college, whatever, that the Roman God, and I use a small g, uh, the Roman God of love was Venus, and the God of war was Mars. Now, to many of us, those are just names of what? Names of planets, aren't they? But, in the, uh, but to the Roman army, it was a crucial sacrifice to Mars and praying for victory to uh, to be had in when they went to to battle, and and then of course the young Roman man would pray to Venus because uh, you know he may have met a girl who had stolen his heart and he wanted to pray that maybe that same kind of love would return and you know she would feel about him the same way he uh, felt about her, but our historic memory is kind of short. Most of us don't know that the ancient Syrian god of wealth and prosperity was named Mammon. And the Lord, of course, ministered just across the border from Syria, and he knew all about their worship of this false god Mammon. Now, of course, he was a false god. And he represented the love of money. Uh, that's why it's sometimes interpreted as money in, even in the scriptures. But Jesus also knew that you cannot have any other God alongside the creator God of heaven and earth. And that uh, to do so, of course, would what? It would be idolatry, wouldn't it? And therefore, he said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Idolatry always involves a different way of looking at the world and doing business. And gradually what happens is that the idol takes over. Greed and worry accompanying so much of the pursuit of prosperity today replaces the moral guidelines of the Bible, and calm trust in God's blessings disappears along with them. Human relationships begin to suffer, and nervous breakdowns often occur, and sometimes, and the, and, and sometimes even worse things. And, and these are all signs that somewhere along the line, someone who is serving mammon has squeezed out serving God. So the question we ask ourselves today who are we serving? I think when I say who, that's, there's really only one answer to that because only God is a who. You know, mammon is it. It's a thing. It, it, ha, it has no identity as far as a, 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 as a personage or anything like that. And yet many will serve that stuff, you know, that they accumulate in their life because, um, well, it's just so... Uh, so inviting, and they want it in their life. And so, consequently, we need to ask ourselves, who am I serving? And, of course, we know that uh, we can't serve two masters as Jesus taught us. And uh, if we serve prosperity and we serve uh, money or serve wealth, we're really begging for heartache in our lives, I believe. So, as the men come, we're going to receive our offering at this time. May the Lord bless you for having come out this morning and uh, brave the cold and nasty weather, and to meet with us this morning. May the Lord bless you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for salvation, 
thankful, Father, for the relationship that we can have with you through Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, now that you'll bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
behind, are you ready? Scoffers, they will tell you this promise can be true. After all these years, nothing has changed. But this Savior who is mine is not bound by time. A thousand years to him is but a day. If the trumpet sounds today, are you ready? He calls the church away. Are you ready? He could come on any day. Take his bride away. Will you be left behind? Are you ready? He could come on any day. Take his bride away. Appreciate folks that are willing to use their talents for the Lord. Or maybe not their talents, but in my case, just willing to sing. Amen? All right. Are you praising the Lord today? By the way, that, the message of that song is awesome because there are people who go to seed when it comes to prophecy. And that becomes kind of a hobby horse from them. But to me, it's pretty simple. Uh, just all you have to do is just live every day looking for Jesus. And everything else will take care of itself. If he comes in, in a few minutes, or if he comes tomorrow, or if he comes in two weeks or two months, it doesn't make any difference. If you're living every day in anxious anticipation, you're all right. In fact, you know, the Bible, when the Bible talks of the last days, that's not necessarily the time that right before he returns, the last days are from the time that he left till he comes back. So, in fact, the early disciples were looking for him to come back right away. So, just live in anxious anticipation of, of the Lord's coming. And really, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Because you know what? This, this world is not all that much. Uh, and it's getting worse. So, uh, I, I'm jokingly saying all the time, beam me up, Jesus. There's no intelligent life down here. So I, I'm ready. I don't know about you. Good song, though. Appreciate that. All right, open your Bibles this morning to John's Gospel, chapter 21. Uh, we are about to wrap this up. I think uh, maybe one more message uh, after this one this morning, and we will be done with John's Gospel. This is sermon number 113. Uh, on John's Gospel, if you're keeping track of that kind of thing. <laughs> Some people are, so. Uh, I like the ones that, you know, put down the name of the pastor and the date that he preached because with this, they've went all the way through the book of John doing that, you know. So they've got notes all the way through there. All right. I, I think they do that because they want to catch you if you repeat a message. Uh, I want to tell you something. I repeat messages. You know, I, I, I'm not going to hide it. Uh, that's right. And, and Morse, Morse got it right. He said, you just need to shout in a couple of different places. I'll never know the difference. <laughs> yeah, I'd I could challenge you. If I gave you a quiz on what I preached on two weeks ago, most of you wouldn't pass it. I, I probably wouldn't even pass it, and I preached it, you know. It, it's the way, it's the reason that God gave his word the way that he did. Because one time's not enough, folks. We need to read it again and again and again and again. So 
I'll just let you know, I, I preach messages over. Um, don't think I wear them out, but I, I, what I call is you, you, you drag the old soldier off, dust him off, and march him back into the battle. That's what I, the kind of way I look at it. All right, John chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whether thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto them, follow me. Saith unto him, rather, follow me. Then Peter turned about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die, yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your amazing, marvelous, wonderful grace. What, what an awesome privilege that we can have to do with the creator of this world the one who spoke it into existence, who sustains it by his will, who provides all good things, who is superintendent over it all. And yet, Lord, you have time for us. And Lord, truly, that's an amazing thing. And Lord, we're thankful that you provided a way that we could be reconciled to you and have fellowship with you, including the privilege of prayer. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us. Lord, we know our bent. We know our sinfulness, our selfishness, as we addressed in the last sermon, Lord, and our, our tendency to try to make life all about us, and, Lord, the misery that results from that. And so I pray that you would help us today. As, again, as we open your word, Lord, we know that this is a spiritual book. It was authored by the Holy Spirit, and that we can only understand it by this help of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would help us illumine your word to our minds and hearts this morning. And always, as always, Lord, we pray if there's someone here that does not know Christ in a, in a saving way, that, Lord, that you would help them to see their condition and see the answer in the Lord Jesus Christ before it's too late. Now, Lord, I for those of us that know you, God, don't leave us the same as when we came. I, I pray for your transforming grace in our lives today, and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The God of heaven... The creator of all heaven and earth is a God of variety. Our world is filled with his creative diversity. For example, no two trees are alike. We were commenting this morning on that tree that's right out there. That is a beautiful tree, but it stinks. Anybody get close to it this morning? Uh there's wonderful variety in the trees and the plant life. No two sunsets are the same. No two human beings are the same. James Montgomery Boyce noted in his commentary on John's Gospel, people are different. A psychologist who classifies his patients quickly is a bad psychologist. A person of whatever training who readily puts people into boxes is not wise but foolish. Moreover, he or she is often quite harmful for a person who does that is subjecting them to the standards of the impersonal world and thus depersonalizing them. Now, the reason for this seemingly infinite variety 
within this world is a spiritual one. It stems from God's purpose in creating people in his own image. Unfortunately, the church, which should be most anxious to preserve and develop this variety, is often opposed to it and instead attempts everyone to adhere to the same mold. The point is, God made each of us different. I got a good perspective on that this morning. I can look and see all of you. You, you look different. I, I, some of you are really different, but that's, an, that's another story. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that when God made us, he threw away the mold. You are uniquely you. And this is... This truth is important for many reasons. For one thing, there is no sense in us comparing ourselves among ourselves. In fact, the Bible says that that's not wise. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. What is, really, what is the point of comparing ourselves with other people when we are different? God has made us different. If you don't look like so-and-so, who cares? I, I'm telling people now, you know, it's the liberating thing about getting older is you don't have to impress anybody. You, you, you older folks know what I'm talking about, right? If you don't like the way I look, turn your head. <laughs> it is what it is, right? You don't, if you don't look like so-and-so, don't worry about it because you're not supposed to look like so-and-so. We have to be careful because we begin taking our cues from Hollywood rather than the Word of God. And Hollywood puts out the images of what is supposed to be beautiful and what is talent and what is worth. And, and many, if they're not careful, accept those standards. What really is the standard for looks and talent and worth? The reality is there's none if we understand that God has made us all different. And made you the way that you are. You are unique and beautiful, or handsome, whichever the case, in your own way. Isn't that liberating? I want to say that little poem, but it doesn't fit, Morris. You know... I can't even remember it now, though. <laughs> all, all I can remember is the punchline. Um, I want to say it so bad. The punchline is ugly, holds its own. <laughs> beauty soon, uh, beauty, beauty is skin, that's it. Beauty is skin deep, but ugly to the bone. Beauty soon, soon fades away, but ugly holds its own. <laughs> but again, what's ugly? We are, the point is, which I thoroughly messed up, we, we are God's handiwork, his creation. And as pronounced in the book of Genesis, it is good. And God made you the way that he wants you with special talents and abilities that make you unique and special to him. And if you don't think you're special, understand that his care over his creation extends down to the lowly sparrow. Matthew 10, 29 through 31, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are more value than many sparrows. 
Now, the reason that I'm talking about this this morning is because Peter failed to recognize these truths, and that caused the problem presented in our text. You remember back to the last message, the Lord had just finished recommissioning Peter. So much for shelf theology. That is, if you mess up, God sticks you on your shelf and you're done. Now, Peter, as far as I'm concerned, did one of the worst things. He denied the Lord, yet the Lord came back to him, restored him, and recommissioned him to ministry. And he just finished that. Now he's going to tell Peter something about his future. Verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou was young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whether thou wouldest. I think that's maybe a little bit of a, a dig at his independent, uh, proud, boastful spirit. But notice what he says, But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. Now the prophecy really deals with the type of death that Peter would suffer. Verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto, them, follow, saith unto him, follow me. In a sense, it's as if Peter's boast that we found in John 13, 37, when Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow thee? I will lay down my life for thy sake. It's as if Jesus is telling him, well, eventually your boast is going to come true. Now, think about this for a minute. Jesus has just told him that at some point he's going to be bound, they're going to take him where he doesn't want to go, and he's going to be killed. Now, you would think that he would be thinking about that, right? You would think that. But instead, his attention is diverted to one of the other disciples, the one that's described as the disciple whom Jesus loved, who leaned on his breast at supper, who said, Lord, who is the one that betrays you? Who is that? You all know. John, right. So, verse 21, Peter, seeing him, that is John probably, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? That's just crazy. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just crazy. But guess what? It is so typical. First of all, it's typical of Peter. Instead of focusing on his own life and what the Lord had for him, he says, what about John? <laughs> What's he going to do? Well, yeah, again, Peter's still learning here. And he is still this uh, control freak. None of us are like that. But Peter was. He's still not only trying to manipulate and manage things, but he's trying, going so far as to try to manage John's life. The result is, Peter gets a kind of mind-your-own-business rebuke. Verse 22, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee, follow thou me? In other words, John's form of service will be different from yours, but that is not your concern. We could say on the basis of this incident that we shouldn't be overly concerned with, still less judge another's Christian's callings, but we're to get on with our own, as we're going to see this morning. Paul said in Romans 14, 14, Who art thou that judgest 
another man's servant. To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now, there's some lessons here. If I, if I couldn't outline it that way, we wouldn't have no sermon this morning, so I've got to do it. Okay. There's some lessons that we can learn and apply to our lives from this exchange between Peter and Lord. And here is the first one. This kind of goes along with what we talked about in our first service this morning. Number one, we should focus on our relationship and our responsibility before the Lord. Again, look at verse 22. Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. If I will or I desire that he remains till I come, what's you follow me? Tenney notes that, The use of the second person pronoun in Jesus' command makes the statement emphatic, you must follow me. And by the way, that's hard to do when your head's turned around. See what somebody else is doing. Amen? Jesus was urging Peter to take his attention off his colleague and focus it on himself. Now, I hope this is not you, but you know what? There are those who delight in making other people's business their business. In fact, they believe that they are the self-assigned Holy Spirit to other people, right? They're forever looking at other believers to see what they're doing or what they're not doing, and they're asking the question, what about this man? And by the way, that's a source of discouragement. If you are looking around seeing what other people are doing or not doing, you you will be discouraged. You start looking around what other people are doing. First thing you know, the Elijah syndrome sets in. I'm the only one. Or if you're from down south, I'm the onlyest one. So and so, they're not witnessing. Or they're not tithing. Or they're not going to church every week. Or they're not doing, you could fill in the blank. Now I know that we need to love people, we need to encourage them, but you, if, listen, it will drive you nuts if you're just looking around to seeing what people are doing all the time or not doing. I, you know, I, I, let me give you a news flash. You can't straighten everybody out. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> In fact, you can't even keep your own life straight. We, we have a full-time job taking care of ourselves. In fact, that's what he's telling Peter here. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? You follow me. You focus on that, boy. Jesus wouldn't have said it that way, but I would. That's that's enough for you. need to focus on us and our personal responsibility before God. 
If the fellow across the aisle is not witnessing the way you think, what is that to you? If they're not giving, if they're not attending church the way you think, what's that to you? Hey, let me, let me help you with this. If you're burdened about witnessing, go witness. <laughs> if, if you're burdened about, you know, people need to be given. You worry about your giving. Amen? Amen? Now, this, this one, those of you who have been around know how I am about this. You know, I used to be a people come up to me all the time, we need to start this ministry, or we need to do this, or we need to do that. You know, you know how I nipped it? Because what they were doing, what they were doing was inventing work for somebody else. And you know how I nipped it in the bud? They started coming. Well, we need to do such and such. I said, you know what? If God's put that on your heart, you probably are the one that needs to do it. They don't come to me anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, if you think that there's a need to be met and there's a people group that needs to be targeted, you... Get with it. You go after them. And I guarantee you, if you get enthusiastic and inspired, you'll take some people with you. But don't worry about what others are doing or not doing. I'll, let, me, let me give you this profound statement here. You might want to write this one down. I don't know if it's original. I might have borrowed it. I don't know. Our responsibility before the Lord is to, resp is to focus on our responsibility before the Lord. Isn't that profound? Uh, in case you're still writing, I'll say it again. Our responsibility before the Lord is to focus on our responsibility before the Lord. It's not to turn our heads around and say, well, what about him? What's he supposed to do? That's a nunya. Nunya business. As a, as a pastor, and I, Morris and others have passed, you know this. Morris will tell you this. You have to get, you have to get over that real quick. Because, like, when we first started ministry, we think, hey, well, I'm ready to charge hell with a thimble full of water and put it out, you know? And thought people were going to fall all over me trying to follow with me. And you, you start looking who's in church, who's not church, who's doing this, who's not doing that, and it will drag you down. So what do you focus on? What, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love people. Warts and all. Amen? Amen. Number two. This one's kind of related because the people who are all ask, always asking, what about, what about this fella? They have another thing that accompanies that, and that's called gossip. Now, you know, we don't do this openly. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't hardly hear any gossip, okay? But I got a hunch it's going on. First of all, let's, let's define gossip. Because some people's idea of gossip, well, it's not gossip because it's the truth. That, that's not the definition of gossip. Gossip is bringing a negative report about someone else when they are not there. It's like, it's like I go to Bruce and say, Bruce, do you know what Morse is doing? Morse told me this morning, you need to keep them kids quiet in church. 
I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> Bruce said, Morris is sleeping in church. That's gossip. So and so is doing such and such. Did you hear that Mr. Ed's not treating his wife right? You know, so-and-so, they're just a snob. I think that person just lazy. Or we disguise it. We have secret gossip. You need to pray for so-and-so. Because here's what they're doing. <laughs> uh, you've got to understand this. All gossip is sin. There, now, there's a right way to handle faulty behavior that needs to be handled, and some of it does, okay? If it's bringing an open reproach against the cause of Christ, if it's perverting doctrine, uh, fundamental truths, you know, it needs to be handled, but it needs to be handled the right way, and gossip is never the right way. In fact, if you are gossiping, you, you have to understand that you are doing the work of the devil. He, he is called the accuser of the brethren. I, I got news for you, folks. I, you know, I've, I've made this confession before, and all of you know it. I, I am ornery. I suppress it all the time, but sometimes it just comes out. Hey, I'm ornery. But you got to understand, I am just as saved as anybody in this room. And the same could be said about all of us. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master? He standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Who are you to judge another servant? That, that belongs to God. When I get to heaven, you will not be my judge. Thank God, because I know God will be easier on me than you. <laughs> Amen? I mean, easier than... We have no right to critically condemn other believers. In fact, if we, if we have to confront somebody because of, again, something that's going on bringing a reproach against Christ, it should be with tears, with brokenness, with weeping. And gossip's especially bad because the individual being accused does not have an opportunity to defend themselves. Again, we have ways to deal with faulty behavior, biblical guidelines. We need to follow them. Gossip is not one of them. Number three. We should recognize and promote the individuality of people. Now, again, there's balance here. We're not, we're not talking about the whole LGBT thing. Okay, because that's sin. All right? But the fact is we're all different in here. Some have brown hair, some... Some no hair, some gray hair, <laughs> some salt and pepper, different facial fever, different weight. <laughs> Grow Oscar bit, fatter, fatter, pile those taters on your platter, listen to me because I'm your hubby, I like you, plump and chubby. <laughs> Yeah. 
Big is okay, by the way. In fact, uh, you know, that, this whole real skinny thing, that started with Twiggy. How many of you remember Twiggy? Twiggy started the thin as in. I'm starting a counter movement. <laughs> Fat is where it's at. I expect a large following. <laughs> we shouldn't believe in box Christianity. And you know what I mean? We carve out this little box and we put on the outside of it what it means to be a good Christian. And then... We try to cram every believer into that box. The Lord wants us to have unity, especially around the gospel and truth, but not necessarily uniformity. We don't have to talk the same, smell the same, look the same. We don't have the same personalities. We don't have the same spiritual gifts. We don't have the same purposes in life. And so we take, take care that we don't try to shove each other into our own little personal whittled out box. You know, I get it. What we're spiritually gifted in tends to be our focus, right? For example, if you have the gift of giving, may your numbers increase. Right, Morse? <laughs> that you tend to think everybody ought to give sacrifice. I mean, give it all, put it all out there. But God's got different things for different people. Amen? And it's not a problem for you to emphasize what you're gifted in and your talents and stuff, but just don't try to emphasize it for everybody else. Because we're different. And it is our differences that work together to accomplish what God wants to. The way that Paul put it when he's talking about spiritual gifts, and not everybody's a nose, everybody's an ear. Can you imagine what it would look like if if when we opened the door Sunday morning, a bunch of noses just rolled in the door, <laughs> our sense of smell would be great. But you couldn't even hear the sermon. Right? Each of us are different. And we need to acknowledge and promote uniqueness. I want to talk about this real quick because I think it's important. There are differences in age groups. Have you noticed that? I talked about this again just here recently. I, in one sense, it's not fair because kids have boundless energy. Wednesday night, they let them out of that building over there. They ran flat out over here and were all over that swing set, just running and screaming and carrying on. And I look at that and I say, I wish I had a little bit of that energy. When they're little, they have boundless energy, but they don't know anything. <laughs> you get older, and you know a little something, but you don't have energy to do anything with it. <laughs> In our church, you know, I, I have heard people, the, the, that's why I was thinking of that joke this morning, more about, Keep those kids quiet. I'm trying to sleep, you know. Kids are noisy. And guess what? They're not going to obey. They're not going to behave like adults. Quit, quit trying to make them behave like adults. They're not adults. They're kids. They got one agenda. Let's have fun. Most days, if I had the energy, I'd enjoy them. <laughs> don't, don't get bent out of shape because the kids are noisy in the church. 
Hallelujah. I wish we had a, I wish they were running all over the place. You know, they're too much trouble. They're going to tear everything up. They put their buggers on the chairs. <laughs> Doesn't that just sound like an old dried up prune? <laughs> kids are kids. Now, I, I get it. We want to try to help them, you know, control themselves a little bit and stuff, but they're going to be kids. And then they become teenagers. That, that, I think Martians invade their bodies at that period of time. They just get weird, right? I, I don't want to quote Bill Cosby because he's not, you know. <laughs> but he said one time, when, when your children become teenagers, they lose their mind. He said, but by the time they're in their 20s, mid-20s, they get their mind back. But in the meantime, you've lost yours. <laughs> Teens are different. There's difference in age groups. Us older people, we, you know, slow down a little bit. <laughs> uh, just, you know, we're not, we're different. Right? Then there's different in personality. I, I don't know if we have to go to Tim LaHaye's Diff, four different main temperaments, but it's obvious that we, we have different personalities and makeups. Some of us, some are reserved. Some are more outspoken. Some, some are quiet. Some talk 120 words a minute with gust up to 180. You know, we're just different. We have different spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Lord, the, there are differences of operation, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then God has different plans for each of us. Not all, not everybody can be a preacher. Not everybody can be a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody can lead songs or play the piano. Um, but you, we all are needed to do the work. Amen? Amen. We're, we're different. God has a unique plan and purpose for your life. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. It's wrong for us to deny in belief or practice, the fact that we are unique in our character and purpose, we are all different, but there is one way that we're all the same, and that is every one of us were born wrong. We were spiritually stillborn, spiritually dead. In that, we're all like We are all sinners. Now, even in this room right here, we're still all sinners, okay? But there is a difference. We got some saved sinners, and we got some lost sinners. The difference is some have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're trusting him for their salvation. They are saved sinners, saved by the grace of God, on their way to heaven. But there may be some of you who are not saved sinners. You're lost sinners. If you were to die in that condition right now, you would go to hell for eternity. I know it's not polite to talk about that in our PC culture, but it's still there, and it's still hot, and it's still reaching out. And you will still go there if you die in your sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person needs to be saved. Every person needs Jesus Christ. The question is, have you invited him into your life? Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you so much for, Lord, your grace to us, for making us the way you've made us. And then, 
Lord, when we rebelled for making a way for us to be redeemed. And Lord, it's my sincere prayer that everyone in this room would know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if not, by your word, by the testimony of these assembled believers, by your spirit, draw them to a saving relationship with Christ. And Lord, for those of us who know you, God, help us to acknowledge that we're all different, have different purpose, different function. We'll have differing rewards in heaven. And Lord, it's all part of your marvelous, creative um, work in, in our lives. Help us to acknowledge it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Hymn number 366. Again, as always, my biggest concern will be whether or not, and I, this is the way I find myself praying now, I want all of you in heaven with me forever. Okay, that's the way I've been praying. I pray for my family. My biggest prayer request for my family is that they would all be in heaven with me. Listen, folks, there ain't nothing any more important than that. Nothing. I, I want you in heaven with me forever. But you have to do what is necessary to make that happen. I can't do it for you. You have to trust Christ. Now, if you'll come this morning, we'll open the Bible. We'll show you how you can do that. But we can't do it for you. You've got to do that. And again, that's my first concern for you all. I, I want to see your faces, your different faces in heaven with me. All right? And then as if you've done that, we're part of the family of God, let's, on the road there, let's glorify God. Amen? And part of that glorifying Him is acknowledging our, our differences and coming together in our differences to glorify the Lord. All right, let's sing. 366, right? If you need to be saved, please slip out of your seat come. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way.